Hello, this is Pastor Frank. This message this week is going to be a short one in comparison to the other ones that I have uh, been posting. This is the biblical portion of something that I want to share with the church family here at the Balsam Bible Chapel this week. Um, this week in my journey through the Gospel of John, I want to stop and look at a story that's very familiar, and that is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's found in John chapter 6, and so if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can turn there. There's actually three passages that I'm going to look at in this message, John chapter 6, Luke chapter 22, and Philippians chapter 2. But the feeding of the 5,000 is not only found in John, but it's found in all four Gospels. But it's in the Gospel of John that we are shown the bigger reason for why Jesus performed this miracle and actually why he performed a lot of his miracles. So I'm going to be looking at those three passages, John 6, Luke 22, and Philippians 2. First, the John 6 passage. Uh, let me pray, though, before I go further. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for, again, the joy of, that I have in being able to talk about your word. And it is your word. I, so I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word and work it into the fabric of our hearts and our minds for your glory and for our blessing and joy. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. John chapter 6, I'm going to begin with verse 5. And this is the New King James. The Bible says that then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Philip answered, uh, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. 200 denarii. Now, uh, denarii was known or was considered a, <coughs> uh, excuse me, a, the uh, average wage for a common laborer. And so what Philip is saying is 200 days worth of, of money uh, is, is not going to be sufficient. That's, that's most of a year. So it's a significant issue that, that they have. Well, verse 8, the Bible says that one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, the Bible says here, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. So there's, there's about 5,000 men. Now, we're not told how many women and children. It could, be, it could have been a pretty good-sized crowd. Uh, according to the uh, United States Census Bureau, Grand Rapids, Minnesota here, and for those uh, who are watching this in our area, you can, you, we know of Grand Rapids, uh, other ones might, may have another town that you could compare to, but uh, according to the Census Bureau, Grand Rapids is something over 11,000 people. And so Jesus is going to take, and who knows, you know, 5,000 men plus women and children, who knows, it may not have been the full 11,000, but it's going to be a pretty good-sized crowd. And Jesus is going to take five barley loaves and two small fish, and he's going to feed this crowd with leftovers. I mean, I mean there's going to be leftovers. Uh, uh, what an amazing miracle. What an amazing miracle. In verse 11, the Bible says that Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples then to those who were sitting down, and likewise with the fish, as much as they wanted. There was no scrimping here, as much as they wanted. Verse 12, so when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragment, or fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets, with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is coming to the world. Now in the Gospel of John, we see why Jesus performed the miracle, this particular miracle. Uh, skip down to verse tw uh, 35 if you're following along. In verse 35, the Bible says that Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. So here he is taking this 
physical miracle and he's bringing the spiritual application to it. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And so Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life, that's huge. Uh, and then Jesus in this chapter goes on to uh, uh, give the details of what he is referring to. And I, I hope that the Lord leads you to read this chapter in its entirety and discover the, this precious aspect of who Jesus is, the bread of life. Verse 37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Uh, that last statement in verse 38 is what I want to settle on. After, after feeding the 5,000 plus women and children, uh, after talking to them about him being the bread of life, he says in verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, we find Jesus saying, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. I have come to do your will, O God. And again, remember verse 38 here in John 6, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, so the first passage is John chapter 6. The second passage that I want to consider is Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 39. Now, this is the familiar account of Jesus in the garden, right before he's arrested. Uh, he's going to be betrayed, and, and here he is in the garden praying. The Bible says here in Luke chapter 22, verse 39, beginning, that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and he, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, okay, now this is what Jesus is praying. He says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Verse 44 the Bible says, being in agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. So notice the struggle that Jesus has, it's the struggle that's going on inside him uh, regarding that which lay ahead of him. There was an awful lot of pain and, and humil humiliation, the discomfort that was ahead of that for Jesus. Now, I think of myself in comparison, and man, I don't even like going to the doctor. Uh, I don't like shots. It's like being poked. Lynette told me several years ago, she said, you know, you should, you should go have your cholesterol checked. Well, I have since then, but I told her at that point, I said, uh, no, because I'd been in hospitals. I'd seen people with black and blue arms from from, from needles, I told Lynette, I said, if they want to put me under, they can take all the blood they want, but I don't want to be awake when they stab me. I don't like going to the doctor at uh, the pain of that. No, no thanks. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> a colonoscopy, that's, that's humiliating. So I don't look forward to going to the doctor. And that's for silly stuff, little stuff. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew the betrayal that was on its way. He knew the abandonment that was coming. He knew the verbal abuse that would be heaped upon him. He knew the humiliation. He knew the extreme physical pain that was headed his way. He knew the Father, the Father would be turning his face away from him. Jesus would hang there on the cross crying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew the loneliness that was coming. He knew the pain of, of seeing his mother. His mother was there at the cross. Uh, Jesus said to John, behold your mother. He said to his mother, behold your son. So his mother was there. And Jesus 
being God, he knew what lay ahead. He knew the pain that would be seeing your mother, having your mother there uh, witnessing what was happening to you. Can you imagine looking forward to what Jesus was facing? The thing that was, Jesus could have said no. At, at any time, he could have said no. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, Jesus said, Do you not think that I can now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels to set me free from this? He says, I can pray and my Father will send me more than, tw more than 12 legions of angels. And according to some uh, figures, that would be around 72,000 angels. More than 72,000 angels. To, to, to deliver him. There's an account in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah chapter 37 of one angel killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. One angel killing 185,000. So I took 185,000 that one angel killed and I multiplied that by 72,000. 185,000 times 72,000, if I did my math right, <laughs> if my calculator did my math right, uh, that equals 13 billion, 320 million people. If one angel killed 185,000, 72,000 could kill 13 billion, 320 million people. Now, as of yesterday at 7.14 a.m., according to the U.S. Bu uh, Census Bureau, and they have, a, they have a counter on that, and so I, I marked the exact time that I wrote this figure down because the, clock, or the, the, the counter just keeps going and going and going. But at 7.14 a.m. yesterday, the U.S. Census Bureau said that the Earth's population was 7,951,018,432 so almost 8 billion people and 72,000 angels could kill 13 billion plus. This world has never been closer to being destroyed. We think about uh, potential World War III and nuclear and things like that. This world has never been closer to being destroyed than then when Jesus could have called the Father and he would have sent more than... Twelve legions of angels. But instead, Jesus prayed to the Father and he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. The third passage that I want to look at is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Beginning at verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of us who are on our way to heaven because of the price, the awful price that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, do we want the mind of Jesus to be in us? Do we want to be available to the Lord to use in a way that glorifies him? To glorify the one who has given so much for us? As brothers and sisters in Christ, children of, of God, because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, do we want to do the will of God, even if it's not convenient? Even if it's not easy? Even if in the process inside we're so wound tight because of the cost that might, it might be, you know, Jesus was so internally and I don't know what the word would be, but he, his, his, his sweat was like great drops of blood. 
because he wanted to do the will of the Father no matter what. Do we want to do the will of God? Do we want to be like Jesus? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible says, this is the New Living Translation, it says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Let me repeat that. Those who say that they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Jesus lived his life to the glory of God the Father. Jesus lived his life with the mindset, Father, your will, not mine, be done. Do we want that mind, the mind of Christ, to be in us? Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. And the example he set, he said, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. There in the cross, he said, or in the garden, he said, Father, if there be any other way, but not my will, your will be done. That yielding of himself to you, Father, for your will to be accomplished through him. That's, a, that, that's amazing. But the Bible says that that mind is to be in us that we are to have that mindset that, Father, your will, not mine, be done. Father, what you're calling me to do, what you're calling me to give up, what you're calling me to pursue, it may not be easy. It may be very, very hard. It may cost me. But, Father, I want to be like Jesus, the one who went to the awful painful cross so that I could be yours. I, I want that mind to be in me. So I want to be like Jesus. Oh, I pray, Father, that that's the prayer of every one of our hearts. That's our desire to be more and more and more like Jesus, which means saying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is something that is, uh, we need to be thinking about. We need to be pondering. We meet, need to be taking it before the Lord. We need to be laying it before him and laying before him our, our struggles. Um, but coming to that point where, like Jesus, because we have his mind in us, like Jesus, saying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. May the Lord bless you and, and uh, give you his grace and his strength as you make that commitment and as you uh, possess the mind of Christ. Lord bless you.